Well, as you heard of, at the end of Joe's prayer, God's got a message for somebody today, okay? <laughs> That's the way it is, okay. All right, but let me just say good morning again to you. It is a joy to be together. Uh, we don't take ourselves too seriously around here, uh, but we do take Jesus very seriously, who is the same yesterday and today and forever. Uh, that's who we're looking at today as we get into this series. If you're new to our church, we're thankful you'd be here, that you would just choose to be with us. If you haven't met us or we haven't met you yet, please introduce yourself some way, either online or at the desk out there or after right up here. We'd love to talk to you and just get to know you. Uh, we're thankful that you would choose to, to make it a big deal to be here today. But we are studying who Jesus is, just looking at him as we behold him and, and as we know more about him, what we believe is that will lead us to love him more as well. And so we're looking at Jesus from the book of Luke, his character, his lifestyle, who he is. Today we're going to look at his patience. Look at his patience, and we'll be in Luke chapter 13 to see that. And one thing I love about Jesus is how creative he was. Not just that he created everything, of course, but, but that he was, he was going about his ministry and he, was, he would utilize anything and everything as his illustrations. Like he would just walk down the road and he'd be like, hey guys, look at that, uh, that fig tree over there. Or let me tell you a story about a father and his sons. And he would just use everything. And, and he often taught in very different ways than we often teach today. Uh, he, he taught very few sermons like we typically do this. He was more stories and more illustrations. But those who listened to him teach remembered everything that he taught. See, that's my goal as a, a pastor is, is this idea of depth that we can remember. Depth we can remember. And so as I was thinking about ways to illustrate so we can remember, illustrate this idea of patience, I naturally thought of a tuning fork. <laughs> You're like, what? <laughs> naturally, right? Uh, so here, you know what a tuning fork is, right? Well, these, these are perfectly designed. There's different varieties of them, but perfectly designed to produce a certain pitch, a certain note. And it, the idea is that you can tune a piano, for example, off of it. Uh, this is the note A here that you'll see, and you just, you just hit it on something, and you you see it produces a certain tone. You can kind of hear it, right? It sounds like feedback, sorry. Uh, but it's a certain pitch. It's A. And, and so you, you see that you can then tune accordingly. Because have you ever heard an out-of-tune piano? Right. It, it's, even if you're not a musical person, you're like, I couldn't even tell what that was. It, it sounds terrible. It's like one of those old westerns where you're hearing just dinking around on the piano and it sounds terrible. It's all out of place. But when that piano is tuned, the before and after is amazing when you see how smooth it is, how beautiful it was. When it's, when it's playing the way it was designed to play, then it's almost a, an experience that you won't forget very often. You know, it's similar with us. That you and I were created to be in tune with God. You and I were created to be in tune with God. Now let me be clear about something here at the jump. We don't just need, like an out-of-tune piano, we don't need just a little bit of tweaking to be in tune with God. We are actually at odds with God, completely enemies of God due to our sin and our rebellion. Due to your sin and my sin, we are at odds with God, but still our design is to be in harmony with God, to be in tune with God. That's the way we were designed to be. And we'll see today, actually, that it is the patience of God that leads us to that. So look now at Luke chapter 13, verses 1 through 9 with me to learn how all of this is going to work together. You'll see it. There were some present at that very time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered them, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that, you, that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, 
unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And Jesus told this parable. He said, a man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it, and he found none. And he said to the vine dresser, look, look, for three years now, I've come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? And the vine dresser answered him, sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and put on manure, fertilizer around it. Then if it should bear fruit next year, well and good, but if not, then you can cut it down. Now, I know, really encouraging on this Sunday morning, right? <laughs> Welcome to church here at Henderson Hills. But I want you to see the, how this idea of, of Jesus' patience, it changes us and draws us into this idea of being attuned to God. But first, we need to kind of understand what's happening. So we first observe the tragedies. Yeah, it's a morbid account in God's Word, but we need to just look at what it says. Observe the tragedies here. We see in verses 1 and 2, some people came and told Jesus about this horrible account of this scene where Pilate, who was one of the Roman leaders in Israel, he had murdered some of these Galileans. Not just anywhere, as they were worshiping even. They were bringing sacrifices in the temple and, and their blood was shed as they were doing that. For whatever reason, this was like a, a terrorist act of some sort where Humans were killing humans. And so that's just the summation of the first tragedy in this text. It has to do with human terrors. First thing Jesus talks about is human terrors that, that are tragedies. That there will be times in our lives where humans bring about tragedy. And this might have been especially bad, this scene, to Jesus and his friends because they themselves were Galileans. Like these were their brothers and sisters who were killed as they were worshiping. And so that's the first tragedy we see. But then in verse 4, Jesus refers to something we assume was well known at the time because he says, you've heard about it, where a tower in Jerusalem just happened to fall on 18 people and killed them. Now, this had nothing to do with someone, uh, a human-initiated incident in any form. This was just maybe classified, we could say, as a natural disaster. So we had human terrors. This was a natural disaster. This tower was a tragic accident. It just fell over and killed people. But there's one more tragedy in these verses. It's in the parable that Jesus told here in verses 6 through 9. Remember the fig tree? What was its problem? It was fruitless, right? For three years, it had not produced any fruit. And then the vine dresser, if his work didn't help it the next year, then what was the end of that tree? The end of the tree was the same as the, the end of the first two tragedies. And so I hope you see the point here that Jesus is making. That there are three clear tragedies that lead to perishing here in Luke 13. Human terrors, natural disasters, and fruitless trees. Three occasions for mourning. Three occasions for grieving. Three occasions potentially for waking up. Which is in fact what Jesus wants his listeners to do here. It's what he wants us today to do here as well. Notice the themes Jesus is communicating through these three occasions. The themes that he wants us to understand as he's telling these stories and responding to these stories. What is Jesus saying to us here? First, he's saying that judgment is coming. His judgment is coming. Now, wait a second. I thought you said this sermon's about patience, about God's patience, right? Now, I thought you said patience is what we're talking about today. No, no, his judgment is coming, and we'll get to patience here in a second. But, but I want us to just stop for a second, how quickly we rush past this. We need to feel what Jesus is saying to us here. Of course, it was terrible that these Galileans were murdered as they worshiped. It's unimaginable. Yes, it's terrible that those, those people died when the tower fell over. Of course, it's unimaginable. 
Yes, it's terrible that that fig tree was about to be cut out of the, the garden and be destroyed. That's terrible, of course. But Jesus clearly says that judgment is coming for everyone who does not repent. Remember how he responded to the, the initial report? He got these people come running up to him potentially and say, hey, did you hear about the Galileans that Pilate murdered? How did he respond? Well, yeah, he could have done a couple things. He said he could, have, he could have called Pilate out and said, yeah, he was way wrong, but then he would have gotten in trouble with the Romans. Or he could have defended Pilate, and then he would have gotten in trouble with the Jews. So what did he do instead? He moves it to a higher level, and he calls out and deals with the sins of the people deals with those people who are talking to him right now. He, he's reading between the lines of what these people are thinking. I mean, just look again at verse 2. Jesus answered them, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? And in verse 4, he says something similar. The 18 on those, the tower fell. Do you, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? See, Jesus is reading behind the scenes here. He understood that they're, they're implying, those people are implying that those who died at Pilate's hands or those who died in the tower falling, they're implying that those people were worse sinners than anybody else. In other words, those people, man, they must have done something really bad to have God judge them like that. In the Old Testament, Job's friends did a very similar thing. When Job was suffering, despite his blameless life, his friends consistently assumed he must have been hiding something. Because at the time, the Jews rigidly connected sin and suffering. This is what one of his friends said to him, Job 4, 7, says, hey, remember, Job, who that was innocent ever perished? Or where were the upright cut off? Meaning, hey, Job, surely you've done something to deserve what you have. Is that not heartbreaking to hear when you're struggling? That somehow all that you're facing is, is some cruel form of karma? Like you deserved it? Now, let me just stop for a second. Sometimes you do deserve what you're facing, right? Galatians 6 talks about you reap what you sow, and so you're going to get life in prison or worse for murder. You're going to have to repay plus some whenever you steal from somebody else. Like, you will have consequences, yes. That's justice. But here's, here's where we get over the line. You cannot always tie difficulty in your life to something that you've done, right? It, it just doesn't always work that way. Like, oh, she's got cancer. I wonder what she's hiding. What? Like, how, how silly is that? How foolish is that? If suffering is always attached to sin, then how do you explain the sufferings of the prophets and the apostles? Jesus. Suffering is not always attached to sin. Sometimes people just suffer because we live in a fallen world. Things are not yet the way that they should be. Now, God can use that suffering for good, James 1 says, of course, but it's just reality. We're going to face hard times. It's going to be hard. That's why Jesus takes their thought process and turns it back on them. Because regardless, he says to them, regardless of what you've done or haven't done, it doesn't matter. What you need to see is that even you need to repent. If you don't, the same judgment is coming for you that it came for them. Right? Notice what he says. You will likewise perish. And maybe you won't die the same kind of death a murder or a tower falling or anything like that, but it just means he's saying the end is coming for you as well. Hebrews 9, 27 says that it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. 
meaning that every one of us, every one of us is out of tune with God on our own. Because of original sin in Adam, because of our own sin today, we are out of tune with God, and what Jesus is saying is that judgment is coming for every sinner, every one of us. But here's what happens, like in Luke 13, there are times that God uses tragedies to awaken our feelings to the need for repentance. Like some of you aren't old enough yet to remember this, but, but even just 20, 21 or so years ago, 9-11 happened. And many of you can think back right now and remember how America was right after 9-11. Right? The churches were full of people. I mean, they're, they're, they're praying at ground zero where it was all the stuff happening. Whole lot of talk at the time about America, you know, being blessed by God and, and we need to, to see how God can use us and change us. There's a whole lot of conversation about that, remember? The problem is that for the most part, it was mere worldly grief. 2 Corinthians 7 talks about that. I encourage you to go read that carefully later. It talks about the difference between worldly grief and godly grief. See, worldly grief merely regrets that something bad happened. And you feel bad about it. And you're sad. Godly grief, on the other hand... It draws us to true grief over our sin. And it says that it leads us, it produces repentance that leads to salvation without regret. Worldly grief, anybody can feel worldly grief. We're sad, and yet godly grief is what we're actually wanting. Jesus is saying these things to those people and to us today that we need to feel the weight of our sin leading to judgment coming for every one of us, and we need to repent of it. We need to feel the godly grief today over our own sin. And the fact that his judgment has not come yet shows us that his patience is merciful. Judgment is absolutely coming for everyone who has not repented and believed, but his patience is merciful because he hasn't just blown it all up yet. His patience is merciful. And so we're looking at Jesus, right? So just think about Jesus' three years of public ministry while he was here on earth. How many times did Jesus encounter people who were terribly sinful, right? I mean, just think of the stories that you know about how wicked people were, that he was walking down the road and meeting, and they were talking to him. How many times did people walk away from him when he said, follow me, because following him meant it would be too hard? How many times did his own disciples not get it? And time after time, Jesus had every right as the holy God of the universe to just blast them, to judge them on the spot, to send them to an eternal punishment for turning away from him. He had every right to do that. But he didn't, right? Why not? Because Exodus 34, 6 tells us of the character of God. It says, He is the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. See, all the way back at the beginning, that's our God. That's Jesus here, that He was merciful, He was patient. He gave people chance after chance. He, he helped them grow as they were following him. He helped them learn how to depend on him that they didn't know how to do before. I mean, you saw all these babies up here. It's like parents teaching their children how to walk, right? It's, it's a patient process. You don't get mad at them for falling over because they're nine months old. 
They're going to fall flat on their face over and over and over. You don't yell at them for it. You record it and celebrate it. (laughs) Jesus is patient with us. He's showing us baby step after baby step how to follow him more faithfully. He doesn't expect us to be here yet when we're here. He's going to walk us down the road patiently. It's mercy to us. But think about this, kind of talking about believers there. Think about this for those who don't believe yet. Even though we on our side might want justice for them, like, God, why don't you take care of that? Look how wicked they are. Look how dirty they are. Look how sinful they are. God, take care of that. We want justice. God is patient with them as well. Just listen to 2 Peter 3. Verse 9, this this is God's heart on this. It says, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise. That, That promise is the one that God is going to judge everything and make it all right. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but he's patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. See, the fact that unbelievers are still alive is a sign of God's patience. That's what Jesus was saying back in Luke 13, right? In this whole story, that that the tragedies don't reveal someone's relative sinfulness just because they're worse, that they got that. No. He's saying those tragedies should wake us all up to our need for repentance. We should count, as later in 2 Peter 3, he says, we should count God's patience as salvation, that he's still giving us a chance. Now, I don't understand how that all works out with God's sovereignty. I don't know how that does. All I do know is what Jesus says here, that if you are still alive and you're hearing this call, you need to repent. That's why Jesus told this parable. Because the Jews, they thought that they were this tree that God had planted, that they were safe because they were Jewish ethnically. We're in Abraham's family. We are that tree. We are safe. But Jesus says, no, no, wait. You're not producing the fruit that I'm intending for you to produce. You're not my branches. You're not really attached to the true vine, to Jesus, so you're in danger. And I'm saying that to a group of people sitting in a church on a Sunday. That's possible for you and me, friend. You know how I know that? Because that's where I was for 20 years. I grew up a Christian. I was living, so let's take the parable, I was living in the vineyard. I was around believers, but my life looked very little like Christ producing fruit through me. Yet what I know is that Christ was patient with me. And Christ eventually saved me from my religion, whatever I thought that was. The Apostle Paul, think of his story. Another example of God's patience, right? I mean, this guy, just listen to him describe his transformation. 1 Timothy 1, Paul himself shares his testimony. He says, I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. Of course, we're thankful for that, but this is what he says. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, meaning I spoke ill of God, a persecutor, an insolent opponent. In fact, he had Christians murdered. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. I guarantee you some of you are sitting out there thinking you're the worst sinner in the world. 
But I receive mercy for this reason, that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. You think you're the worst. You don't hold a candle to Paul in how he lived his life. But God saving him, patiently walking him towards salvation is an example to you that you can be saved to. Anybody can be. That's what the parable in Luke 13 said, right? He is patient with us, wanting us to see we need to repent. I came across, as I was studying for this, a very similar story to Luke chapter 13, a parable that is told there. It's a story that is circulated in the far east, not the east coast, far east, like way over there or across the ocean. And the story is almost word for word, this parable that Jesus says, but it involves a palm tree. And, and, and as they're telling the story, they add something interesting, though. So this, this debate between the owner and the vine dresser, the owner and the, the person tending the palm trees, there's a debate, of course, about whether to cut this tree down or not, just like we see with Jesus. But in the debate, the owner who has come and said, there's no fruit on the tree. The owner, with the back of his hatchet, bangs the tree three times shaking the tree, causing the tree to tremble. And as he's hitting it, saying, if this tree doesn't have any fruit next year, we're going to cut it down. Just, just think that that's what Jesus is doing for you today, unbeliever. That right now, he's warning you that judgment is coming. He's, he's hitting the trunk of your tree. He's wanting you to feel the tremble a little bit about this, that this is coming soon for you. And believer, think about it the same way, that he's, he's shaking your life too. He's wanting you to examine yourself to see whether you are producing fruit or not from your life. And so we get this, this fear, of course, but like, oh, what are the solutions then, Jesus? I mean, we, we all feel kind of the weight, the heaviness of this. So Jesus, what do we do with this? How do we fix this? What's your answer, Jesus? We saw it already, right? First, for you, if you do not believe in Jesus, the answer for you is to repent and be in tune with God. Your answer, unbeliever, is to repent and be in tune with God. Romans 6 says the wages of sin is death. It's that perishing we've seen all over this today. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. See, the encouragement, as we just saw with Paul's story, as we've seen with all of this today, the encouragement today is that it is possible for you to be assured that you are in tune with God, that you are in his family, that you, even if tragedy comes, even if you die somewhere, you didn't expect all of that, which, by the way, it's all coming for us, and we don't expect it. No matter what, you can be assured that you are good with God. You can be assured that he's good with you, more importantly. How? 2 Corinthians 5 says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. He took our place. Sinless Jesus carried our sin to the cross. He paid the price for it, and he left it in the grave when he came out of it on the third day. And so, yes, of course it's terrible that people perish like they do in Luke 13. It's horrific to think about our own perishing coming one day soon. It's scary. We kind of push it back. We don't want to think about it. But the good news, friends, the good news is that Jesus perished for us. 
The, the perishing we're talking about, he took the judgment we deserve to make us fruitful branches. Jesus, like the Galilee, Jesus was murdered and his blood was the sacrifice for us. For our sins, to cover them, to make us right, to put us in tune with God. So just like Jesus said, unbeliever, you must repent before it's too late. And what that word repent means, you turn away from your sin and yourself. And you turn to Jesus and say, I'm all yours. You reorient your life away from that towards him now. He's been patient with you to bring you to this point. But remember, the judgment's coming soon. You don't know when. That's why today is the day of salvation. Stop hardening your heart towards what God is calling you to right now. And right where you are, just cry out to him and say, Jesus, I'm done with myself. I'm giving my life to you. He will save you. Repent and be in tune with God. But like I said, believer, this passage speaks to us too, doesn't it? See, Jesus' parable showed it that if you truly are a, a tree in his vineyard, then he recreated you and planted you in there to bear fruit. It's what he created us to do. Now, how do we bear fruit? What does that even mean? It means you live a life that is visibly changed, visibly different in how you now live out his commands as you didn't before. How do you get in tune with God like that? You abide. Now, you, you can't abide if you haven't repented to begin with, so all of us need to repent. But as we repent, we abide in Jesus. One of my favorite passages in all of Scripture is John 15, where Jesus talks about this and he gives us the solution to that fruitless tree in the parable in Luke 13. Jesus says, here's how you bear fruit. John 15 says, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, neither can you. Unless you abide in me, Jesus said. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away like a branch and withers. And those branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. Later he says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide. You see it, right? This is the solution to the fruitless fig tree in Luke 13. The solution to that is not trying harder. The solution is abiding better. It's abiding in Jesus some of you have taken God's patience for granted. When you need to see that his patience is intended to lead you to repentance, to lead you to change, to not hold on to that stuff anymore, to not live that life like you used to anymore. He's made you different. Abide in him and let him produce the fruit out of you that he's designed to produce. And so, brothers and sisters in Christ, if you want to be in tune with God, if you want to play the melody line that he has uniquely designed you to play, then abide in Jesus. He's saved you. He's made you a new creation. So rest in him. Remain in him. Don't try to go on your own strength. Cling to him with all that you have because he's holding on to you. And as you do that, watch 
watch him produce, patiently produce the fruit he wants through your life. What a God that we have who's patient. But let's, let's not take that for granted. His patience does have a limit. So repent and abide for his fruit through you.